Okay. Next talk, Stefan Maar, how to get a JIT compiler for free. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, virtual machines, or actually just in, um, yeah, just simple interpreters instead of uh, just in time compilers. Because one of the big problems we have is that way too few people actually work on the virtual machines they use. So in so open source projects in general, typically, you have way too few contributors, but uh, then typically you have only one person maybe, well, I think there are at least two people in the room who have been touching virtual machines. Um, but there are way too pe few people actually looking into how to get all that kind of stuff fast and how to make it work and all kind of platforms. So um, I've been looking a bit into that and what we can do about it. And I've been looking into that using a very simple small talk because it's easy to implement and you can implement it in all kinds of different variations. And that's actually a small talk they have been using for teaching. So here down below you see a couple of the universities who have used that. And the main design constraints here were to have something really simple for teaching, to have something that's really showing the concepts in the ideal textbook way, uh, which typically means it's not very fast. And then we have a couple of interpreters implementing that. Actually, we have uh, all kinds of different implementations and all kinds of different programming languages by now. So, but as I said, one of the main drawbacks is the whole thing is pretty damn slow. But it's easy to teach, um, as you can see here, on two of uh, yeah, pretty common object-oriented benchmarks originating from the small talk world, Richards. Well, actually, Richards, I don't think so, but at least doesn't do. But they have been used uh, for small talk, JVMs, JavaScript, and PyPy, I think. And you see like 500x slower or 70x slower than Java. Java is, of course, uh, well-tuned, and uh, hundreds of many years went into making Java fast. And our simple interpreter, of course, can't keep up with that. So but, uh, what we want is, of course, something different. We want a simple interpreter that perhaps everybody of the community can change in order to make certain things better. Um, it has to be a simple implementation, it has to be conceptually clear to really lower the burden. For instance, in small talk you have your primitives. If you want people to be able to add new ones or adapt them or basically replace a mechanism by something like native boost, then you need people that actually can change the virtual machine implementation. So we want all of that. But of course, we also want kind of that, so at least that region, the same order of magnitude would be nice. So the green, now unfortunately cut off, um, is actually uh, the cock virtual machine here. So on Delta Blue, barely 20% slower, and on Richards, uh, it's six times, seven times slower. But at least not the 500x. Uh, so that's where we want to go. And ideally, with that kind of very simple interpreter. So how do we get there? At the moment, just-in-time compilers, as I said, it's uh, really just a few people doing that. So often it's just arcane magic. So there's one person in the team or in the community doing that. We see that uh, in the cockroach machine, that's basically Aljurn uh, Rana. The Lua people have uh, the guy behind LuaJIT, and uh, I think there are other communities like Racket where it's very similar. And then the other option is basically to, well, have a big, big office or infrastructure for engineers, the Java way, the IBM, the Google way, the same way they built Dart, for instance, just have the engineering resources to do that. So, but uh, none of those solutions is really sufficient. So, let's look a bit into what uh, science came up with recently. And, uh, well, it's really unfortunate. Um, down below here, you see actually the references. But, um, well, the slides will be online later, so you can look that up. Uh, but there are two interesting options. So you might have heard of PyPy. They use uh, infrastructure they nowadays call R Python. Um, they have a meter tracing just on com time compiler, which is a very interesting approach. And then very recently, um, Oracle Labs open sourced a project called Truffle. And uh, they have self-optimizing interpreters um, based on partial evaluation and the whole tool chain um, based on the Graal uh, just-in-time compiler uh, tool chain 
to do those kind of things. And I'm going to briefly look into both. So what's some? Just to give you a brief impression, that's a simple small hall that has been developed, uh, I think, around 2000, somewhere in Aarhus, at the university for teaching. Um, a text-based syntax to make it really simple to build the very first interpreter. And uh, as you can see here, object uh, doesn't have a superclass, has a primitive to get the class object of an object, um, has a point a quality primitive and other stuff. Integer, for instance, has addition, subtraction, and so on. Um, and then, of course, we have things like booleans in the system, and that's very much the small talk tradition. You really have a polymorphic method um, that's then using the standard if true, if false, or to implement it. And if you look at the true class, you see if true is then actually implemented as you would implement it. Uh, very simple, straightforward, in an ideal uh, small talk implementation by just evaluating the block and in the false case, just returning nil. So, a very straightforward, simple um, small talk, typically based on an interpreter. And to explain how that uh, works, let's look at the factorial. So, I don't have a shopping cart. My running example is a factorial, to keep it even a little bit more simple. Just to explain, uh, I think everybody can read that here, I suppose. Can anybody not read small talk? Okay, good. Very, very. So, um, small talk, the first thing you notice is uh, those um, two things here. That's actually one method invocation, or in small talk, a message sent. And the, the receiver, so the object on which you invoke that, is uh, here the evaluation result of that pair of parentheses. So, we have the simple comparison whether n is zero or not. And if that's true, then we evaluate the block, which is a closure, um, and uh, return just one as a result. Otherwise, we, we evaluate that block, and we'll just recursively evaluate the factorial. So nothing too fancy. Um, maybe if you can't read small talk, maybe you're better with reading something like bytecodes. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. So, um, that's, uh, I don't know how better I can shrink or move my slides somehow. But, um, hmm. I will, I have to try to change the resolution once more. Is it going to be a big problem with the recording? Uh, maybe just try. Well, let's, let's do it. Can I, can I do the animations here? No, probably not. That kills it? Yeah, it breaks. Well, then I will reset it after that slide, I think. Anyway, so um, now we at least see the slide. So the idea is if you want to implement an interpreter, the classic thing to do is to build a set of bytecodes and then have a stack machine um, to interpret those bytecodes. So if you actually compile the factorial to a very, very simple bytecode set, so in the simple thing in small talk, I think we need something like 16 operations. Some of them are like pushing arguments from the function, pushing constants, <laughs> doing the actual send, and then special things like pushing a block and returning from the function. So if you imagine, if you think how that could be executed, your our example code, uh, that's actually the first thing we do if we invoke that method factorial with 4, we push the 4 on the stack. And then the second operation is the 0. And uh, thereby we can now actually do the message sent here for the comparison. And that will, on our stack here, so if we don't look into the details of how that comparison works, yield the result false. So very simple stack operation. We use the stack to basically build up first the arguments for the message sent and then have the result on the stack. So, and afterwards, you can imagine uh, very much the same for to prepare that send. Here, we push the two blocks onto the stack, and you send the result. And eventually, 
either uh, a one, which uh, was the result of that block, or uh, the actual factorial will end up on the top of stack here, and that's something we can return. Okay, let's try to make the recorder happy again. Uh, no. Okay, better? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I basically showed you now how to interpret such a bytecode sequence based on the factorial program. The implementation of that is also more or less straightforward. So we have here in a kind of Python syntax, because that's actually more or less the R Python interpreter I implemented. Um, and you see here, yeah, the interpret method, you get a message you want to interpret. You have a frame, that's basically the stack I showed you on the side. And what we then do, we basically loop over all the bytecodes as long as we uh, have bytecodes or actually as long as there is a return bytecode. So we start, uh, then here is a bytecode, and then typically that's a very standard thing. We switch over the bytecode and jump to the right thing uh, to do. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's very classic, that's not very fast, and that's actually what more or less yielded the thing with 500 times slower than Java. So now here comes the, the meta tracing of Python, or not Python, R Python into play. Um, that's what the PyPy people also use to implement their um, really fast Python implementation. So the only difference that comes actually in here is that we tell basically the R Python infrastructure that that specific bytecode loop here uh, can be yeah the start of uh, yeah, how do I phrase it um, yeah normally hot loops or that's that's an interesting point to start to generate native code so if um, the R Python notice at such a point, such a merge point for the just in time compiler, that uh, a certain loop has been executed again and again, then it can assume, ah, okay, now uh, we can actually spend a bit of time to compile that into really fast native code and generate our, uh, yeah, do all our optimizations to generate that code. That's not always useful, so that's why we need to, to do that explicitly, tell us that. But that's more or less what we actually need to do. So um, what does the tracing then actually mean? Well, let's look at our factorial example again. So what's happened now is we execute, um, we start executing that method, and we take basically the first byte code. So what that means, if we are now in the tracing mode, we actually ignore things like jumps and uh, branches and so on, and instead um, really just record the important actions and certain assumptions. And I left also out assumptions, uh, so really just recording, reading and writing of fields, because that's what's really interesting. So what mm -hmm. happens is we actually need to go to the method object, get the bytecodes out. Um, yeah, we remember that in the variable, and then we go to the index we had and read out the bytecode and the arguments. And then as I said, we are not really recording any kind of jumps, which has now happened here at the switch, but uh, we, we really just record the actions. But we know now that actually the first bytecode in that method was a push argument bytecode. So what now happens with the push argument bytecode is exactly that fragment. And as you also might notice, we actually didn't note down any kind of method invocation because it's all not really relevant. We really just want to know what were the concrete actions performed. And uh, then here again, we start with a frame get argument. So we go to the frame, 
you go to the arguments array, get that arguments value out there, and basically note all those operations down. Then we want to, per to perform the push itself. So we need to go to the frame. We get the stack pointer out, we increase the stack pointer, we write the stack pointer back, and then we get the stack out of the frame, set the specific uh, position at the stack with a value, and now we actually pushed the argument. And if you now continue and imagine, ah, okay, well, first, we of course need to increase the bytecode index, which we don't see on the slide, um, but th then we execute the next bytecode. And then it happens all over again. The very, very yeah, well, at least very similar uh, sequence of operations. And there you might already see, ah, actually, we do quite a lot of stuff again and again. And that's where actually the tracing, um, and the meta tracing in particular, has a lot of benefits here. So if you, for instance, look a bit closer at the trace, and we see here at the beginning, just accessing that uh, bytecode array, we do at least twice. And at least for every bytecode once. So now I have two bytecodes only executed, but methods or typical execution traces will be much, much longer. So and then the other thing is here, access to the stack array, which should be happening somewhere down here as well. And we can really just remove those operations because we put that here in a temporary variable already and that's really the same value. And a, a simple optimizer can see that. And then we see here the same kind of stuff, pattern again, increasing the stack pointer. We can also um, yeah, ideally optimize it out. And the people around the R Python project did the necessary research and they actually showed that about 90% of the op yeah, operations in such a trace can be on average eliminated. So I think that was between 40 and 97%, depending on the kind of uh, benchmark they run, that you really eliminate all those operations and then can ideally really re reach the peak performance for a specific problem um, by using that kind of tracing compilation. And I think the success of the PyPy project uh, shows it very much. So, but uh, that's only one approach to implement interpreters. And I had to explain you a stack machine and how to do all that, and that was already a bit, a bit hairy and not very straightforward, and it was also not very clear how to compile actually that code to a bytecode set, because it's mm, yeah, a linear representation of something, which if you would use a simple parser, probably would more look like a tree. So if you parse, that uh, that function, then we have that if true or false as the main message sent basically, and the receiver on the left, and then the arguments, the first block and the second block, in a tree structure. And uh, yeah, actually implementing interpreter for that is pretty straightforward as well, maybe even more simple. So if we imagine we had here um, such literals. So they're really in the code as a constant uh, given. And we can just implement that on those AST nodes, if you want, uh, with an execution set, and really just return the value. And very similar for, for reading a variable. So if you compile that code, at least in Smalltalk, it's very simple to know at which position that variable should be. Um, so we can just uh, remember a certain index or a name for the variable and then just really read uh, the variable. In then we interpret that AST and execute that execute method. So that's really very straightforward. It's, I would say, even simpler than that stack machine. And then we can even look at something more complex here, a message send. What's a message send doing? We have a receiver and maybe an argument, right? So if you have a binary message send, what do we do? Well, we simply execute the receiver expression because the receiver is going to know what actually he has to do to, know, to return us a value. And the same with the argument expression, we also just return that. And here I didn't have to encode the stack explicitly, I can actually just reuse the stack of my implement, implementation language and just have in my code here a uh, receiver argument variable and so on, and don't have to think about ah, stack balance and what do I have to push first, what do I have to push later and so on. So implementing that kind of interpreter seems to be much more natural. And then you can go um, go to the receiver, get its class, 
do a lookup with a selector, and uh, then you get the message that needs to be invoked, and we just return the result here. So, at least from my perspective, that seems to be much more natural and simple way to implement an interpreter. And that's uh, where Truffle comes in. Um, so the Oracle people here actually came up with an idea to optimize those kind of AST-based interpreters by, at runtime, um, specializing those ASTs based on what actual values were observed. So taking that message sent, one of the most important things here to specialize for is actually uh, the lookup, the receiver, and the method we eventually want to execute. So especially in small talk, where you have to walk dynamically the inheritance chain uh, to find the method or the method that corresponds to the selector, uh, that's a pretty expensive five minutes, yeah. So um, I'm only sketching how that works here, especially with time constraint. Um, the idea is really you have that uh, AST tree here, and that's then specialized to an execution tree um, that has very specific nodes in there that really does just perform the minimal operations or go to a fallback node. So one thing you can see here indicated with colors, um, that variable read, for instance, became read an integer um, to avoid overhead of boxing on a JVM, for instance. Um, and that, that generic binary send converted into a cache send with a couple of extra nodes. So the class check is an extra node, and then here is actually an inlineable send, because uh, often you get much better performance if you inline a method, because then you can specialize it in the calling context. And, uh, well, because sometimes you, you do really have polymorphic message sends, um, that one single cache node might not be enough, so you have actually a chain, and uh, so you can have something like a polymorphic inline cache, which is, yeah, customly, yeah, tricky to implement in a virtual machine, but very important, especially for small talks. And here it's really a tree structure, or, well, at least, yeah, yeah, I think it's still a tree, um, and of nodes, and you have a very high level representation of all of that. And that builds very nice interpreters, and they get actually pretty fast. And uh, how fast? Uh, is it just a toy, or is it really what we want? That's uh, the results. So what I have to say at the moment, um, the R Python version, so the stuff running on top of R Python with some meter tracing, um, I had the support of Carl Friedrich Bolz, one of the PyPy guys, who actually made it that fast. And as you can see here, we are barely 30% um, slower than Java. If you remember, the cockroach machine was 20% slower than Java, so we are still a little bit behind. Um, so on Richards, we are in a fact within a factor 10, which is more or less our goal, so just barely slower as Cock as well. Um, the troublesome here, I unfortunately, still stumble into some bugs here and there. Um, just recently, uh, the Oracle guys actually thankfully fixed a couple of things for me. Um, well, Non-local returns, one of the most important features in small talk for the control structures, wasn't supported all that well, and uh, caused a lot of yeah, recompilation uh, problems. So I haven't been able to tune that as much yet. And uh, it's also much more to the implementer here than um, to, the, to the black box tool chain but I think uh, we can get uh, where we want. So, now as a conclusion, the question was, can we have maintainable design, simple implementations and clarity to basically reach more people actually maintaining interpreters and uh, virtual machines? And I think, uh, yes, that's, that's totally possible. So the, the nice techniques uh, they have with either the meter tracing or the self-optimizing interpreters that's a good foundation for that stuff. Um, when it comes to performance, well, I would say at least it's plausible. But um, it still has to be seen exactly, but I think it's also possible with, with both things to reach that kind of performance. And, well, where is that leading? 
I hope that's leading to me investing a bit of time to push those kind of ideas into Marte and maybe the, the cockroach machine at Siestaberg uh, together with the Farouk people. Um, yeah, so, but that's for the future, so there is nothing uh, happening yet. So, are there any questions? Well, it will probably depend on the ERP system, but if you if you really just want to implement a very simple interpreter for for instance domain specific language, it's um, um, script. It has to be scripting language to actually uh, catch errors from printers from uh, from mail. So if uh, if, if, a, if a printer gets an error, uh, then the client has. Has to be able to write a script to actually uh, say, yeah, those persons need to be mailed and that mail need to be sent. Well, depending a bit on what kind of infrastructure we are talking about, so the truffle stuff uh, with the AC interpreters, which I would think is a very nice and simple idea uh, that can also be applied in different contexts, um, that runs on Java. So you could just uh, go to their open source um, page and uh, look a bit around, uh, there's not a lot of documentation which, a bit, which is a bit of a problem, but there is like a simple language implementation that shows a couple of concepts. So you can try to look that up. So it's uh, under the DAO um, umbrella of the OpenJDK. Um, and otherwise, uh, uh, you can also easily implement on top of something like Faro or Blue Small Talk, a simple AST interpreter. That's uh, very straightforward. So uh, just grab your textbook uh, and go devise a, a grammar implement an AST interpreter. That sh so I don't mean, I don't know uh, what to advise more. So um, those techniques we have here are really for performance, and I don't know whether that's a critical point in your thesis. If so, no, then it's uh, the more simplicity of syntax and better mm -hmm. performance because the clients are aren't necessarily programmers. Um, it's an ERP system, so I believe ERP yeah. system's performance is yeah. kind of like important. Due to time constraints, uh, I would like you to take it uh, offline and talk later to the okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Fame? Oh, it's a bit cut off, but I guess it will work. Yes, please get a bit closer. 